Okay. The next thing is that the video recap quiz. So we have, uh, so this sheet all of you should have. In fact, you know, I'm just trying to say that you have to fill up your video quiz, uh, the recap quiz questions that I'll now be projecting. You have to fill up your answers in the sheet that is given to you and then hand it over to the TAs. TAs, please collect it from the set of students submitted to you. You have to fill in your roll number, name, the slot. So we are in slot 11, today's date. And then, you know, we may not have eight questions every day, but up to eight questions can be given. We may not have all five options for every question, but up to five options will be given. And you have to tick all that are applicable. Some of the questions than one correct option, you have to tick them. For example, in this case, you know, this is just a sample one. It doesn't mean that today's quiz will have these as the solution. Okay. So there's a for loop in C++ where the different placeholders have been filled up with X, Y, Z, and W. And you're required to tell us which of the following statements is correct. Okay, we're not asking for the ones, we're asking for the correct ones. The option A is X, Y, and Z may be empty, but W cannot be. B is all of them may be empty. And C says if Y is not empty, then X and Z cannot be empty. And D is none of the above. Okay, if you have seen the video lectures, it should be very straightforward. Okay, so we'll give you a minute, and after that, we'll move to the next question. Okay, now we move to the next question. Which of the following is a C++ expression? And more than one answer may be correct. The first option is X is assigned Y plus Z, then it's X plus plus, and it's while true X plus plus semicolon and break semicolon. So we move to the next question. The precedence of a sign as an operator is which of the following? And more than one may be correct. Same as that of plus and minus, less than that of plus and minus, more than that of star and slash, it's multiplication and division, and less than that of logical and logical or. So once again, these are not meant to be tricky questions. These are st straight from the video lectures. If you've just seen the video lectures carefully, you should be able to answer them. It's just to figure out whether you're actually watching the videos. Let's go to the next one. It's about the continue statement in a for loop. What does it do? It specifies that the loop must execute infinitely, causes the next loop iteration to start causes the program to terminate immediately, causes the loop to exit immediately. Move to the next question. Consider this for loop and which of the following are correct. So I assign 0, comma J assign 10 will cause a compilation error. J minus minus comma I plus plus will cause a compilation error. Both of them will cause a compilation and compilation. Okay, we move to the last question. Specifying loop invariants as comments serves which of the following purposes? Helps the compiler optimize the loop. Helps us reason about the loop's correctness. Helps the compiler ignore errors in the loop. Helps the computer skip executing the loop. Okay, so what we'll do now is, uh, you know, I hope all of you have answered the questions correctly. If you have seen the video lectures, it should have been very easy. What we'll do now is we'll quickly go through some of the important slides from lectures 23, 24, 25, based on which the, the current quiz was. And uh, then we'll look at problems. So if you have seen the lectures, you would have already seen that the assignment operator, assignment can also be viewed as an operator, not only as a statement, okay? And uh, for example, when we write something like x is assigned y plus z, if you put a semicolon at the end of it, this is a statement. It computes the value of y plus z. y plus z is an expression. It computes the value of y plus z, assigns it to x, right? And without the semicolon, this will be viewed as an expression where the assign symbol is treated as an operator, just like plus is an operator here. 
and what does this expression do? The type and value of this expression are the same as the type and value of the part to the right hand side of the assigns operator. Okay? And when you evaluate such an expression with an assignment operator, there is a side effect. The side effect is that the value of this expression gets stored in the variable x. Okay? So with the assignment symbol, not only can you write assignment statements, but you can also write assignment expressions as a side effect of which you get the actual assignment of a value to a variable. Okay? So this was there in the video lectures. So for example, in a for statement, if I say count is assigned 1.0 here and count is assigned count plus 1 here, these are really assignment expressions with side effects. You could put other expressions also there, that is fine, but if you put these expressions and there are those side effects that something is getting initialized, something is being updated at the end of the iteration. This expression will be evaluated once before you enter the loop. This expression will be evaluated at the end of every iteration of the loop. Okay, and if evaluating the expression has a side effect, then that side effect will also happen at the end of every iteration. And then we looked at some special assignment operators, the post increment operator, which is x plus plus, right? So this is an expression. What is the type and value that it has? It has the same type as x, and the value it has is the same as that of x before it is incremented but it has a side effect and the side effect is that the value of x will actually be incremented. So the value of the expression x plus plus is the value of x before incrementing. You evaluate the session, it has a side effect which is that the value of x will actually get incremented. And if you have this y assigned x plus plus semicolon, so this is an assignment statement on the right hand side is the expression x plus plus and suppose uh, we say that the value of y prior to execution of the statement is 10, the value of x prior to execution of the statement is 2. Then what will be the values of y and x after the statement executes? So y will get assigned the value of the expression x plus plus. What is the value of the expression x plus plus? It is the value of x before incrementing. What is the value of x before incrementing? That is 2. Okay? So y will get assigned the value 2. But in evaluating the expression x plus plus, you would end up incrementing x. So the value of x after the statement would be 3. Is that clear? And similarly, you have the pre-increment operator where you put the plus plus before the variable or the expression. And this, this also increments as a side effect. It increments the value of x. But the value of this expression with the pre-increment operator is the value of x after incrementing as opposed to the previous one, which was the value of x before incrementing. So if you have y is assigned plus plus x semicolon, this is an assignment statement. The expression on the right hand side is plus plus x. If the value of y and x are 10 and 2 before that statement is executed, then when that statement is executed, the expression plus plus x is evaluated. What is the value of the expression plus plus x? It's the value of x after incrementing. So that's 3. And what is the value of, uh, and what happens when you evaluate this expression is a side effect x is incremented. So x also gets the value of 3. Is that clear? And then there are some compound assignment statements which you can think of as shorthands. So when we write x plus equals y plus z, it really means x is assigned x plus y plus z. So whatever comes to the right hand side of this plus equals is what is to be added to the current value of x and the result has to be loaded back into x. It has to be stored back into x. Okay? And similarly for the other operators, minus equals, star equals, divide equals, remainder equals. Okay, So x percent equals 5 means that x will be assigned the value of x percent 5, the remainder of x on dividing by 5. Fine? So that is straightforward. And then uh, there was an entire video lecture, the last one, lecture 25, on how to reason about loops. So while you know we believe that you should know that you know how to reason about loops. Uh, if you if you're not understanding that immediately right away, that's fine. You can come and revisit that later. As you write more and more complicated programs, you'll begin to appreciate the importance of that lecture. When you write a loop, you must first be clear in your head what is it that you want that loop to do. So that is captured by preconditions and postcondition. Precondition is the relation between variables before the loop starts iterating. 
post condition is the relation between variables after the loop has completed its all its iterations and the loop is basically incrementally changing the relation between variables from what it is in the precondition to what it is in the post condition okay and the loop invariant is a relation that holds every time the loop iterates so in the video lecture we had actually worked out an example where we had shown what the precondition post condition loop invariant might look like so the precondition and post condition can be seen as special cases of the loop invariant loop invariant holds at all points whenever you reach whenever you begin an iteration of the loop the loop invariant holds at that point uh, and in order to ensure you know when you write a complicated program and you have a loop there and you have some complex loop condition you want to make sure that the loop actually terminates otherwise it might you know it might be a non terminating or infinite loop so it's desirable to have some integer valued metric typically an expression on the variables of the program which monotonically changes towards a fixed value so for example a counter decrementing from n to 0 or a counter incrementing from 0 to n so it's monotonically changing in each iteration of the loop towards a fixed value and this metric which changes in each iteration of the loop and eventually reaches that fixed value is also called a loop variant and uh, this is useful to argue that your loop is actually going to terminate okay so uh, are there any doubts on the video lectures uh, so so what is not clear can you tell us so pre so when you write a loop right so i mean right now we are going to do that we are going to give you some practice problems and we'll say write a program with loop which does it so how do you go about doing that you know if i let us say uh, so so to take an analogy right i mean if i say that let's go from here to let us say you know srinagar do you just say let me jump onto the road and start walking and then i'll figure out how to reach srinagar you don't do that right you sort of plan it out beforehand that well maybe i'll go from here to here through train and the train will take me from here to here from there to there i'll go by bus the rest i'll go walking or whatever i'll take a bullock cart or something so you actually plan out things when you have a certain objective to do you, you don't just jump onto the road and say let's start walking wherever my eyes can see and uh, finally i'll figure out how to reach srinagar so similarly a programming is a similar task if i ask you to solve a problem and if you're trying to solve it through an iteration construct you have to plan it out what is it that you want that loop to do what what should be the purpose of that loop why are you putting that loop in there right and the precondition is saying this is the relation that existed between the program variables before the loop the post condition is saying i want this relation to hold after the loop executes so that's the precondition and post condition at a very high level it's some relation on the the post condition is really what you want to achieve by the loop the precondition is from where you are starting right it's like saying my precondition is i'm standing in iit bombay in powai my post condition is that i should be standing in the center of srinagar and then in between what do i do so what i'm saying is this is needed in order to plan your program when you write a program you should know what is it that your loop should do from where to where should it take you so it should take you from the precondition which is some relation between the variables to the post condition which is again some other relation the desired relation between the variables at the end of the loop iteration is that does that help okay and then how do you do that you know one could say let me you know take a leap of faith from here and let me just jump and i'll land up in srinagar that's a one step thing right but alternatively what you could say is that i'll do this and then i'll do that and then i'll do that so loop is basically trying to do that right it's saying i'll do it in multiple steps but in each step i'll do some action so that when i put everything together i reach my whatever you know i, I reach the desired goal so loop invariant is saying that as you are taking these steps are you sure that you're actually trying to go from where you wanted to go from your you know starting point to your ending point so loop invariant is a relation that holds between the variables every time you start iterating the loop every time you say i'm going to take a step it should be an invariant that for example you know the, you could say that the distance from iit bombay to srinagar 
should be the sum of the distance from IIT Bombay to wherever you are standing plus the distance from wherever you are standing to Srinagar. The shortest distance from IIT Bombay to Srinagar should be the sum of the distance that you have already covered in going from IIT Bombay to wherever you are standing plus the shortest distance from there to Srinagar. So that is the invariant. That is the relation which you want to hold at every time you are trying to take the next step. Right? You do not want to go through a very long and circuitous route. So you want the shortest distance from your source to your destination to be the sum of the distance that you have already covered in coming from the source to wherever you, you are plus the shortest distance from there to the destination. Right? So loop invariant is something like that. It is a relation that holds every time you are trying to take a step. The first time you are trying to enter the loop, it is basically the precondition and the last time you went to the head of the loop and then you came out because the loop condition was violated, that should be the post condition. Does that make sense? Right? So, so as I am saying that, uh, you know, as you look at more complicated programs, you will begin to appreciate this much more. But even for simple programs, I think it is very, it is important to be clear in your mind, what is it that you are doing with the loop? The loop is, I mean, do I want a loop which does nothing? I mean, why would I want to put that loop? There is no point putting that loop. Right? So, if I am if I'm trying to get the loop to do something useful, let me be very clear about what is that useful task, what is the initial relation between variables, what is the final relation between variables and how am I progressing from the initial relation to the final relation. That is the loop invariant, a special case of which is the precondition and the post condition. And as you iterate through the loop, you are maintaining that invariant, but you are moving from the precondition to the post condition. And the loop variant is just saying that you want to make sure that this entire process terminates, right? that you do not go on forever. So as long as in your loop there is a counter or something which is monotonically changing and you know that it can only change for only finitely many times, then you know that the loop is only going to iterate finitely many times. Okay. So now what we are going to do is uh, we will start with the practice problem. So this is our first practice problem. So the question marks show up red here, but they show up black here. Okay, so I guess you can see the question marks. Uh, so this is a program fragment where we have three integer variables, i, j and n. We read the value of n and then we have a for loop. The three parts of the for loop are separated by semicolon, right? So it's okay. So, so this is the first part, i assigned 0, comma j assigned something, that's the first part. Then the semicolon, then there's the second part which should be the loop condition and then there is the third part which is what should be executed every time the loop iterates. After the end of every iteration, the expression there is going to be evaluated and the only statement you have in the loop body is printing out j. Okay? And what do we want this little code fragment to do? We want it to output the first 5 powers of n, whatever this n you have written over here. So n raised to 1, n raised to 2, n raised to 3, n raised to 4, n raised to 5. So you have to fill in the missing parts so that this code outputs the first 5 powers of n. Is the question clear? Okay. So for the next 5 minutes, try to write down the answer in your notebook. It is not a very difficult problem, but you should know what the different constructs are. So remember, this part is executed just once. This is the expression that is evaluated before you enter the loop just once. This condition is checked every time you want to get into the body of the loop and execute it. And this is also executed every time you have finished the body of the loop. right? So this will be executed after this. This will be evaluated before this. And this whatever is over here will be evaluated just once before you enter the loop for the first time. Interestingly, almost everybody has come up with a very similar looking solution. So i is 0, j is 1 and then i less than or equal to 4, j is j star n and i, i plus plus. So is this correct? No? Why? j equals to 1 is wrong. So why is j equals to 1 wrong? 
the first time so this statement is executed only the first time this expression is evaluated only so where is sahid yeah so this statement is ex this expression is evaluated only the first time before you entered the loop after that this condition is checked and after that you execute this statement right so when you evaluate this expression j gets assigned the value 1 then 1 is indeed less than or equal to or whatever 0 is less than or equal to 4 and then you will print 1 so regardless of what n you input you will print 1 right and what is the fix for that n right ok so that is one solution uh, ok here is another one so does this work I is oh wow so there are one two three semicolons here or maybe even four semicolons here this is not even going to compile must have only two semicolons there are three parts which are separated by semicolons so so which one of them did you want to keep as a semicolon and which one of them but you know in the original question I had a comma over here so we have changed that comma to a semicolon okay so you have to understand the difference between a comma and a semicolon right it is clearly explained in the video lectures so suppose this was a comma and let's say that was also a comma so would that be correct would that solution be correct how many times would it iterate it would iterate six times right it's less than or equal to five so less than or equal to is written by a less than followed by an equal to okay in, in the program but even if you wrote less than or equal to the right way this will iterate six times so it will print the six powers of n okay so that also seems to be an error uh, let's look at this this is Shantanu's copy j is assigned n i less than 5 j star equals n i plus plus is that correct so so I'm kind of intrigued that all of I mean all that we required was that this loop should iterate five times right so i is 0 i plus plus i less than 5 is certainly one way of iterating the loop five times that's not the only way for example I could increment i by 2 and then check whether i is less than some 10 or something so so, so this is not even a single solution in this class which looks like that okay so uh, you know if you look back at the original question all we have done is we have initialized i with 0 and then uh, we have required the loop to be iterated five times right but there could be different ways of incrementing it and corresponding conditions to be checked and all of those would be correct as long as you iterate five times so in some of the uh, you know whether you put less than five or less than or equal to five it does matter whether the exact number of iterations it will have so uh, the TAs could please distribute these copies so now we'll go to the second program or the second uh, problem so is everybody fine with this question right we just want the loop to iterate five times i is doing that job you can do it in one of several ways looks like everybody has incremented it by one and then check whether it's less than five and then the real action that happens with j is it has to be initialized to n over here and it has to be multiplied with n in every iteration okay okay so now uh, you can exchange your copies with your neighbors this is a simpler question and of course in this case there is only one correct answer okay so what do you think gets printed out here sir 10 10 and why do you think 10 gets printed out there sir x plus plus is a post increment operator so first it will uh, give the output as 10 and then it will increment the value of x okay and then uh, the next one is y one, yes minus sir. minus y yes sir so it is a pre decrement operator so first it will decrease the value of y by, by one and then it will give the output okay so good so now let's hear about the other two from uh, so so does everybody agree with these two so who who has got a different answer from this so all those differing pairs you agree with the first two there you agree with the first two okay okay now let's look at okay now let's hear from you what is what what is the next thing that it prints out which is x plus y plus plus it prints 12 it prints 12 so how many of you agree that this will print 12 sir i got 11 you got 11 okay 
So, how did you get 11? Sir, because x has value 10. Oh, no, 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 it will be 12, 12, it will be 12. It will be 12? Yeah, x will become 11 and then y is 1, so 11 plus 1, 12. Okay. So, x is 11 and y plus plus gives out 2. So, x, x plus is 2. 11 and? y plus plus will give 2. y plus plus will give 2. Yeah. Okay, why should y plus plus give 2? Because the value of y is 1 and y plus plus is yeah. y equal to y. So, so if you remember what is this, this is an expression, y plus plus is an expression with side effects. If it is an expression, it must have a value and a type and then it will have some side effects also. So, the value of this, this is a post increment operator. So, the value of this expression is the value of y before the increment. The side effect of this expression is that y will be incremented. Okay. So, the value of this expression is the value of y before the increment. What is the value of y before the increment? It is the value of y after the previous decrement. Okay. Right? So, therefore, although y will get incremented as a side effect, but the value of the expression y plus plus is the value of y before the increment. Okay? So, this is important that the side effect and the value of the expression may not match in their values. Right? So, the next question is this code fragment and uh, you are required to figure out what will be output. So, it is very important when you write a piece of code, at least small pieces of code to be able to sort of mentally execute it or you know, execute it in your copies and to understand what will it do for some given values of the input. So, this is basically an exercise in that. Given this code fragment, can we mentally run it or can we run it on our copies and and, and find out what the output should be. Okay? So, here there are two integer variables num and i. Num is already initialized to 0 while declaring, i is not initialized and then there is a simple for loop. This is the remainder on division by 2, this is the continue statement and then something is printed out. So, any disagreements, any pair of students whose outputs disagree? 1, comma, yeah. 4, yeah. comma, yeah. 9, yeah. comma, yeah. 16, comma, 25, comma. Okay. So, uh, yeah, let, let's just see. So, I will go from uh, the value of i changes from 0 to 9, right? i is 0 till i less than 10. And each time if I take the remainder with 2, then it will keep, once it will be 1, the next time it will be 0. For even numbers, the remainder is 0, the odd numbers, the remainder is 1, right? And uh, if you look at the original pro uh, problem, if the remainder is 0, then you continue, which means what? What does continue do? You just forget about whatever you are doing and go back and start the next iteration, right? And of course, before starting the next iteration, you increment it and then you start the next iteration. And uh, otherwise, for odd values of i, num plus equals i. So, is this clear what that does? Num plus equals i basically means i is added to num and the value is stored back in num. Okay? So, we, we had shown this earlier. x plus equal to y plus z means x plus y plus z and it is assigned back to x. So, num plus equal to i, what does it do? This is the same as saying num is assigned num plus i. Num plus equal to i just means this. Okay? So, if you keep adding the numbers, then you will find that you get the squares of the first five numbers. Okay? So, initially, uh, so num is 0 to begin with. So, initially num is 0 and then when i is 1, num becomes 1. Right? Then when i is 3, num becomes 1 plus 3. which is 4 and then when i is 5, num becomes 4 plus 5 which is 9 and so on. Is that clear? 
right? So this is just a matter of executing the program, just following the instructions step by step. Okay, you, you just start iterating. So if i is zero, then zero divided by two, the remainder is zero. So you continue. So you do i plus plus, i becomes one, and you enter the loop again. One is less than ten. You enter the loop again, and now division by two gives a remainder of one. So you execute this. Right? What is going to be printed here? The value of this entire expression. This is an assignment expression. The value of the assign assignment expression is the expression on the right hand side of equal. Okay, so now uh, this is the last problem. So in the last class, we actually saw how to compute the nth power of an integer using repeated squaring. Okay? So we said that n squared is n times n, n raised to 4 is n squared times n squared n raised to 8 is n raised to 4 times n raised to 4. So basically the number of multiplications we were doing is log n base 2. Calculate n raised to 8, you needed to do 3 multiplications, n times n, which was n squared, and n squared times n squared, which was n raised to 4, and n raised to 4 times n raised to 4, which is n raised to 8. So now the question is, uh, if m is not a power of 2, of course, I can always calculate m raised to n by multiplying m n times. I can use whatever, you know, n minus 1 multiplication operators and get m raised to n. But if n is not a power of 2, we would like to compute m raised to n using not too many more than log n, so maybe twice log n. Okay, of course, log of n base 2 and all of that ceiling and all is fine so many multiplications. So you're required to write a C++ program with loops to do this. And here is a hint. So suppose n is 13. So as an unsigned integer, I can represent it as 1101. So here is where your understanding of binary representations of integers actually comes of use. Right? So if it is 1101, then m raised to n, which is m raised to 13 in this case, can be computed as m raised to 8 times m raised to 4 times m raised to 1, right? 8 plus 4 plus 1 is 13. But where did I get this 8 plus 4 plus 1? That's exactly how 13 is represented in binary. This is 8, this is 4, this is 1, right? So because 13 is 8 plus 4 plus 1, so when you write something in binary, of course, you are adding up different powers of 2 to get the final number, right? So whatever you are adding up is a power of 2. and if something is a power of 2, we have already seen how to calculate m raised to that power, right, using just. So if I ask you to calculate m raised to 13, you should first calculate m raised to 8, m raised to 4, m raised to 1, and then just multiply them, okay. m raised to 8 can itself be calculated using 4, you must have calculated n root to calculate m raised to 8. And m raised to 1, you must have calculated n root when calculating m raised to 4. And then you just multiply them together, okay? So we want you to write a C++ program using, so you know, if you can't get it in 2 times log n, it's fine. If you can get it in 3 times log n, 4 times log n, it's fine. But some linear multiple of log n, right? It should not be n or n minus 1. And I hope you see that this makes a huge difference, right? So suppose if n was 1000, right? then log 1000 base 2 is something like 10, right? So doing 10 multiplications or even 20 or 30 multiplications is far less than doing 1000 multiplications, right? So this is basically a smarter way to calculate the exponent m raised to n, the exponentiation. And you are, I think from what you have learned so far, you should be able to write a C++ program with loops to do this. So I request all of you to write that down in your notebooks. So the question is that we want to calculate m raised to n. So you'll read m as an integer, n as an integer, and I want to calculate m raised to n. Now in the last class, what we saw is that if n was a power of 2, we could do this in a smart way by using only log n multiplications, right? Basically, you repeatedly square it. So now we want to do this when n is not necessarily a power of 2, right? So basically, the problem is that write a C++ program with loops to calculate m raised to n, in which the number of multiplication operations you're using, the number of times you'll have to actually use multiplication, 
is some, you know, I mean, if, if you don't get it in two, two times login, it's fine. Three times login, four times login. But it's some constant times login. It should not be n minus 1. n and login are very different, right? 1 is exponential. So that is what we want you to do. And here is, I guess you can see how it, at least in your mind, you can see how this can be done. Basically, take n, think of it as a binary number. And you're really adding powers of 2 to get that number. For each such power of 2, you know how to get m raised to that power in an efficient way. And then adding numbers in the exponent is equivalent to multiplying those corresponding things. Right? m raised to 8 plus 4 is m raised to 8 times m raised to 4. So, so let us say that n is 33. Okay? So we know that 2 raised to 5 is 32 and 2 raised to 6 is 64. So log n base 2 will be 5 point something. So what is the ceiling of log n base 2? That will be 6. So what is 2 times ceiling of log n base 2? It is 2 times 6, that is 12. Right? So basically what we are asking is, if you have to calculate m raised to n, in this case n is 33, so basically if you have to calculate m raised to 33, write a program which calculates m raised to 33 using at most 12 multiplications. Right? The simple way to do it is to keep multiplying m and so you will need 32 multiplications. <coughs> right? m square can be calculated using one multiplication, m cube using two multiplications. So here m raised to 33 can certainly be calculated using 32 multiplications, but we want you to get using only 12 multiplications. Is the problem clear? We are basically trying to optimize on the number of multiplications because multiplication is actually an expensive operation on a computer. It takes time, takes power. So if I can have an efficient way of calculating exponents, that's good. Okay, has anybody come up with the solution? So, Rudrajit, uh, basically reading in M and N, that's fine. While A is greater than 0, A is initialized to N over there. And while A is greater than 0, R is the remainder of A divided by 2, A is divided by 2. So, so what is this loop computing, Rudrajit? So, while A is greater than 0, so this will basically, I think, end up computing the most significant bit or something, right? Oh, you're ca just calculating how many number of bits by using this S plus. Okay. So, you know, I mean, I, I guess this is a very good example. We, you write a loop like this and then Rudrajit and I are trying to understand what this loop does. I mean, if there is a, if there are comments, if there are preconditions, postconditions, it will become very clear. And we can also go and check whether all of that is correctly being done, right? So, when you write a loop to do something, put those comments in. It, it helps you also as you write the program, it helps somebody else to understand, okay. So basically he has used this loop to calculate the number of bits in the binary representation of n. And then while n is greater than 0, you're just calculating the bits, is it? C is m, so this is where the repeated squaring is happening. And you're repeatedly squaring it for the number of bits, I can see that. Okay, so, so there is a while loop here and within the while loop there is a for loop. So what is the while loop doing? Okay, so, so there is some nice logic that he has used here, but the way it has been written it becomes difficult to read. So please, you know, when you write program, put comments. I think your program is correct, but you know, I have not checked every detail. I can also see something interesting over here that Rudrajit has actually tried out some input examples and I think this is very important. You should do this. When you write a loop, work it out by your hand to make sure that it's really calculating what it's supposed to do and then uh, and only then can we figure out. So, so here is a uh, you know interesting piece of program with one while loop at the top that calculates the number of bits in n and there is another while loop at the bottom with a for loop inside that. But you know, I think while you have followed the spirit of the problem, 
but it looks like every time you'll st every time in this loop you'll start with m and you'll go and multiply this for the example i showed which was 13 so in 13 it has to compute m raised to 8 it has to compute m raised to 4 so it looks like you're first computing m raised to 8 and then afresh you're computing m raised to 4 so but you know you need not have done that in computing m raised to 8 you have already computed m raised to 4 when you do this repeated squaring right so so what you might have ended up doing is that i think in your case the number of multiplications can probably go as much as log n times log n so i mean while the idea is interesting but i'm not sure if you can do it in a constant times log n because you're recalculating things that you've already calculated right m raised to 8 and m raised to 4 you're recalculating m raised to 4 again you already calculated that when you calculated m raised to 8. So, uh, okay. So, in the interest of time, what we'll do is, so, so please complete this problem on your own. Try it out in your lab sessions. And then we'll discuss some solutions in the next class. And uh, try to keep in mind that we are trying to minimize the number of multiplications.